I'm Jasmine Moradi, and you're listening to the Queens of Tech podcast, a podcast series about raising the voice of workplace champions. 60 plus questions in around 30 minutes with women, non binary, and transgender influencers about their journey into STEM science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I started the Queens of Tech podcast initiative in May 2022 because I would like to retain more women, non-binary and transgenders in the tech industry. Talent is out there, but our work environment needs to improve for all to feel safer, stay authentic and to be valued for our contributions. My vision is to raise the workplace ecosystem for all in the tech industry by killing the imposter syndrome, stopping bad behavior and increasing equity opportunities. Each podcast talk is built around 60 plus questions regarding upbringing, education, career path, DEIB, and future advice. My mission is to bridge the gap between schools and workplaces by getting to the heart of my guest's personal life and career journey to inspire other girls, women, non-binary, and transgenders to unleash their full potential to reach top leadership roles in the tech industry. My goal is to raise the voice of tech champions around the world and together with companies, investors, and politicians, raise the challenges and opportunities around equity, inclusive diversity, and belonging in our workplaces. Enough is enough. I would like to enforce companies to build a sustainable, inclusive culture, to retain diverse talent, so we keep the workplace power equity to continue building future diverse and inclusive products. Your voice matters. In this episode, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Tech Queen Angie Ma, Chief People Officer and Co-Founder of Faculty AI. Hey, Angie. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. I'm very happy to have you join us from London, UK. Now, let us dive into your journey into STEM. Hope you're ready for the Queens of Tech 60 plus question. Let's warm up with a few fun facts about you. How would you describe your personality in three hashtags? We actually played a game recently in a team and it turns out how you describe yourself and how other people see you very differently. The three hashtags I would describe myself would be square, sheen and forgetful. How would you describe your life in three sentences? It's been full of changes, adventures, lots of growth, and people around me really care about me, and it's about overcoming limitations. What kind of music stimulates and motivates you the most? All sorts. Depends on my mood. Right now, all I could really do is some relaxing jazz for my headache. What is your personal motto? Can't really control the results, but you do a good process. What is your favorite book? Principles, Life and Work by Ray Dalio. What is your favorite podcast? Quite a few. At the moment, I'm going through a phase of listening to any podcast about history. I love listening about history stories. So at the moment, Dan Snow's history hit. Mac or PC? Mac. Say something interesting about you that most people don't know. Well, I have lots of spiders, not the big ones, but lots of small spiders at home. I forbid my other half to kill them or anything. What is your hidden talent? Sleep. I'm able to sleep anywhere, anytime. If you were going to write a book about your life, what would the title be? That's probably Finding Treasures and Misfortune and Mistakes. Lovely. Great start. Now, let us dig deeper. Our childhood has an effect on our adulthood. Our early experiences shape our belief about ourselves, others, and the world. I want to discover your childhood. Where did you grow up? I grew up in three different places. I grew up in Beijing, Hong Kong, and the UK. East and West culture. So I was born in Beijing. And when I was about five, my family immigrated to Hong Kong. And there I spent about 10 years. And then I moved to the UK since then. What was your dream job as a child? My Chinese name is the name of an ancient Chinese medicine doctor. My family really wants me to become a medical doctor. So from a young age, I always thought that. However, from about teenager, I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to be able to fly a plane and in fact, even better, a fighter jet pilot. What was your favorite subject in school? Physics and economics, because I really love understanding how things work and also really like my physics and economics teacher in school. What was your least favorite subject? 
I would say at university, I really dreaded nuclear physics because my letter was horrible. I couldn't understand anything in class. I couldn't do any of the homework afterwards. Oh, it was awful. What is your earliest memory of technology and the arrival of the internet? I had my first computer. It was a secondhand computer, a throwaway from my dad's company at the time. This was back in mid 80s. So computers were very basic. In fact, I remember very clearly, it didn't have any the graphical user interface. You had to do use command line. And if you remember floppy disk, at the time, the reason why it was called a floppy disk, they were actually quite big. They were like eight inches. They're like vinyls and they were floppy and they could only store something like 80 kilobytes. So that's about the size of a small profile picture in your account. And that's all it could save. But then it was brilliant because I could play games. I could do things. It was really novel at the time. Which were the three first technology gadgets you owned? The computer that I got when I was seven or eight. And then I got a really cool Lego set because it had motors and things like that. So I could program it to do drawings. So whilst it was a toy, I would say it was definitely a technology gadget. And then it was mobile phone. But this was really back in the day where mobile phone was huge, like a water bottle. Who was your female role model growing up and why? It would be my paternal grandmother. She has huge influence on me, mainly through her life story, because she was born in the 1920s. In that era in China, it's regarded as a virtual for girls not to go to school, not to be educated. My grandma and her four sisters, only one of them could go to school at a time was the boys could all go to school. As five sisters, they had to take in turn each year to go to school. And whoever attended school would come back and teach the other sisters. So it's just the kind of life she had to go through in that era. And when war broke out in the 30s, she still insisted to leave home and attend university. It's extremely rare for a woman to go to school and let alone university. She was one of the very, very few girls at university. And she was one of the first women studying law in China. And it didn't matter that she got completely cut off from her family because of the war. And so she had no means of supporting herself and she had to make due. But she overcame all the challenges, finished her study, graduated. And after she got married, she had five kids, but she had to work almost like a single mom because my grandpa was in prison for political reason. You know, working, looking after five kids, looking after her parents, looking after my grandpa's parents. It was really tough. And because of her family background, she had to go through a really tough time during the war, during Cultural Revolution. But she never, ever complained. She never, ever victimized herself. She was extremely knowledgeable, articulate, wrote and drew beautifully. I remember she managed to persuade the mayor of Beijing not to demolish her house in the central Beijing. It was quite an achievement. She had no problem stand up in a persuasive and convincing way. And even in her 90s, when I tried to, you know, tell her that do watch out for your cholesterol, be healthy. She ended up giving me a lesson about different types of cholesterol. I really learned from her that it's important to thrive, to be brilliant, regardless with gender or background or anything, and not to have a victim mindset, no matter how disadvantaged you are by your environment and how you could always try to be resourceful and resilient and succeed despite, you know, situations. And of of course, she's been a very loving grandma and I, I feel very fortunate to have someone like that, a very strong, unique female role model growing up. How do you think where you grew up and the school you went to and the generation you come from influence your education and career choice? Maybe part of it is very much cultural from an uh, Asian culture. There's very strong emphasis on learning and also technical subjects as well. It's like math, engineering. So from an early age, I was interested to understand the world. That has really laid the foundation of how I think about the world. And of course, later on, further education and career. Now, I'm going to read two quotes. First one, how does the universe expect me to choose a career path at 16? I can't even choose what I want for dinner. Second, Abraham Lincoln said, I quote, the best way to predict your future is to create it. I want to know the choices behind your career path. What did you study at university? I study physics at university and it's actually quite a coincidence because in the UK, the university has a system where you have to achieve certain results in our university 
entrance exam in order to be able to go to the subjects of your choice. Now, I didn't actually achieve the result I needed to study electrical engineering, but I did do a summer class of physics, which I absolutely loved. I decided actually I wanted to do physics instead of engineering. Was that what influenced you to get into your choice and field then? The field I'm working in is artificial intelligence, and it wasn't a direct influence. I think physics is really a subject that allows me to understand the world mathematically and to actually have that specific kind of scientific thinking. But in terms of artificial intelligence, I did not study that in school. During my PhD doctorate, I really got interested in the kind of existential risk for humanity. And one of them was artificial intelligence. So I was very interested in AI safety, specifically, and that got me really opened up to artificial intelligence and how, God, this is 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. And what professional roles have you had before that led you to start your own company? I went through a very unusual career path. So I did my undergrad in physics. I attempted startup after my undergrad. Great idea, but not quite the right team. So fail spectacularly, very quickly. I study law, but realized I would be a very lousy lawyer. So I decided to go back to physics where I did my PhD. Then at some point, my co-founder came to me with an idea. And at the time, I was actually already thinking about leaving academia. So then we decided to start the company. It's quite an unusual career path. It was very much coincident after coincidence. What does faculty AI do? We are a applied artificial intelligence company. We are probably one of Europe's largest company of its kind, and we help organizations to make better decisions. What is your title and what is your main responsibilities? My job title is Chief People Officer, and my remit is really everything people related. And people is basically how we describe HR, but to us, we see it as a much, much bigger than the typical HRs. So that's why we call it people. Why did you start a company? Well, we started with fellowship. Fellowship is a eight week boot camp to help STEM graduates to transition into industry. At the time, I wanted to go into industry. I was one of the PhD graduates that needed a course like the fellowship, but there wasn't any. So my co-founder and I, we decided actually we know the users, which would be us. And I had some experience with setting up companies before running startups. So then we decided, okay, let's give it a go. What does a typical workday look like for you? That's a great question because there isn't a typical work day as many work in startup will know. But what I can say is that it's incredibly dynamic and fast paced. So it's never boring and you learn so much on the way. So often people say working startup for a few months is like working a year or two corporate because of the speed and the pace in startups. I love the quote. Choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. So Angie, what do you love about your role? I don't feel like working at all. It's like doing something you really enjoy. I find most rewarding and enjoyable is working with brilliant people. When I think, oh, I have a good idea, but when working collaboratively with others, they make it infinitely better. It's really incredible to see the result. The other is in my role, helping others to flourish is a key part. I think many people will find that satisfying as well, seeing other people being part of their journey of success. And selfishly, I guess, personally, because we have gone through such a growth as a company from just the three of us to now 300 people plus, that journey meant that I had to learn different skills, really improve myself, and that learning and that growth has been rewarding too. What is the best experience you've had in your role so far? Any examples? Too many because we still run the fellowship program. And so you see a lot of fellows who then went on to have really successful career. And that's really good feeling. It's very difficult to describe. So I would say that would be the best. And what is the biggest challenge you've encountered so far? And how did you tackle that? 
Over the years, I've had a number of coaches where they really helped me to overcome my challenges. And one thing I've learned is really myself is the biggest challenge. I usually am the person holding back. Once I could change my perspective, I'm able to find new solutions, to try new things. Out of all the challenges, myself is the biggest challenges. And the biggest challenge is how can I change my perspective and change the way I see things? What do you wish everybody understood about your role? I guess maybe HR in general, people tend to misunderstand it as somewhere it's about compliance. It's about if there's a problem, if you're about to get fired, you go to HR, which is totally the opposite what people as a function is about. Certainly, I'm sure there'll be some very traditional HR still somewhere out there. But if you look at most of the tech company or good organizations, their people function is about helping people to thrive. So it's about how their experience is in the organization, how to help people to learn and develop as quickly as possible. What is the one common myth about your profession or field that you want to disapprove? People often talk about how you need to be really technical to work in tech. And I think that is just completely untrue because there are technical roles are just one subset of roles in the technical industry. There are so many different roles, for example, marketing, operations, project managers, and all of that are critical for the success of the technical industry. Whilst you have to be good, meaning you have to have really good domain expertise and being very Technical is a bit of a misunderstanding. Angie, what do you love about working in the tech industry? We solve really interesting problems and very impactful problems as well. For example, in our case, people think AI might be about really cool chatbot facial recognition. But actually, for example, work really helped the NHS, which is the National Health Service, to save lives during COVID to help managing how many beds, how many ventilators they need. Oprah Winfrey said, I quote, think like a queen. A queen is not afraid to fail. Failure is not a stepping stone to greatness. So what have by far been your biggest achievement in your career? I feel incredibly proud of faculty, more precisely proud about the team and the environment, the culture we've built. So hence allowing like really awesome people to build faculty and achieve what we have achieved so far. Then what is the biggest factor that has helped you become successful? Any success habits? Everyone in startup will say resilience because you will come against a lot of obstacles. Being persistent and hard work, it's really crucial. How do you measure your own performance at work? For me, because I have to deliver through my team. So really my success is really how well my team does. Is my team being productive and happy and have they achieved their goal? What is your biggest failure in your career and what did you learn from it? There, there will be a long list. So we as a company grew very quickly in terms of size. People might have heard that when you change in size, things really change. You have to change how you operate. For me, it's about how to upskill as quickly as possible because I have to operate at a different level. If I get too behind, I don't catch up with the speed of outgrowth. And so there has been times where it's very different communicating to three to five people versus to 100, 200 people. And those would be my learning. What is inspiring and motivates you the most in your role in career right now? I still have to learn lots of new things. We're still growing. So again, the scaling, how do I operate and behave at a point where we are 500 or 1,000? That is exciting to me. But also the artificial intelligence as a field is very exciting. It's full of new papers, new technology coming out every day. Let us not jump into the influence of mentorship and role models. Role models can consciously or subconsciously be a powerful force in our lives. In addition, mentors can guide us through our career journey and open up the world of possibilities. Angie, do you have a mentor today? I have lots of mentors. In fact, people used to make fun of me that I collect mentors. I have a collection of them because they are incredibly helpful and useful because they all share and give you different perspective. Who is the female role model you look up to in your field? I have lots of people that are different qualities that I really admire and look up to. And I would think whenever I come across a challenge, what would that person do? And I find that incredibly helpful. 
History shows that it has been more common for men having mentors and role models in business than women. So Angie, how important do you think it is to have a role model mentor during one's career? I have had a lot of both male and female mentors and role models being able to see what you would like to become or aspects, qualities you become. It just brings it to life and makes it more concrete, something you can work towards. Let's move on to leadership. Shirley Sandberg, CEO of Facebook, said, I quote, leadership is about making others as a result of your presence and making sure that the impact lasts in your absence. Angie, what does leadership mean to you? Leadership is about building great teams and leading the team through behavior that reflects your leadership value and the value of the organization. It's more about how you behave, less about the job title or even the number of people you manage. What do you then consider a good versus a bad leader? There are lots of behavior you can point out, but I would say to me, a good leader is where they really help people thrive versus a bad one. But that's not about being nice. I'm not saying it's about being horrible. Leader is about what's good for people, pushing people, pushing your team, caring about them. So it's helping people to thrive. And sometimes it might require being direct. How would you then describe yourself as a leader? If I had to choose, I would be more servant leadership style, where I like to put others first, thinking how I could support people to achieve what they want to achieve. And as a leader, what values are most important to you? Seeking truth, execute pragmatically, fostering talent, and always invert. What leadership lessons have you learned that formed you into the leader you are today? There are many different styles of leadership. In fact, what I have learned is that as leaders, we need to be quite flexible about our leadership style instead of, say, identifying what we need to achieve and then apply the right leadership style. What are your three strengths and three weaknesses? I always think that qualities are not absolutely good or bad because what might be strengths at one situation could be a weakness and vice versa. So I would say to make this more specific is like what are the qualities that might impede to be effective in my role? As a leader, I think we need to be speaking truth. We need to find out exactly what's going on instead of having very strong assumptions. And especially whenever human beings are involved, it can be very messy. So we really need to apply that rigor in understanding what's happening. Communications is so important as people, professionals and leaders. And if we don't do it well, then we can't communicate to the staff, to people what we're thinking, what we're planning to do. and even difficult decisions that need to be made. Let us now jump into the hottest topic in business today, workplace culture, unblocking the power of diversity, quality, inclusion, and belonging. And you are a people leader, Angie. What does diversity, quality, inclusion, and belonging mean to you personally? It is such an important topic. On a personal level, I enjoy living in an environment where you get to interact with people who think differently, have different backgrounds, have lots of interesting cultural aspects. So it makes life much more interesting and rewarding. To me, it's not possible to have diversity if you don't have an inclusive culture. And to make it happen, it can't be just saying, hey, we need to be more diverse and we have these sets of policies or we do these things. It has to be the integral part of the organization. It has to be the DNA. What do you consider being three to five signs of a good company culture? The foundation prerequisite of having a diversity is to have an inclusive culture. What well, signs of good company culture is what are their values and how those values are brought to life by the people. Vocabulary or some slogans people stick on the wall. It has to be something alive and breathing that everyone is, is doing. As a woman, what has been the most significant barrier in your career and how have you overcome these challenges? As a woman, I feel very lucky. I didn't find 
barrier as a woman. I find barrier of me as a person in a sense that the challenge I had to overcome is not specific of me being a woman. In the past, there was the time where I would have self-limiting belief and thinking I'm bad at something because I'm a woman. And I think a lot of people would have had that experience. That is self-limiting because suddenly it's not something I could change, but rather it's me fundamentally being a woman. Whereas if I let go of that, then I felt much more empowered and I knew how I could go around and developing and get better at something. Why do you think it's important for more women to join the tech industry, especially as leaders? In tech, we solve very complex problems. And what it means is that these are no simple solutions. It's very complex. And to find the right solution, you need that diversity of thinking. And as we know, tech industry is still quite male dominated. Again, it's more about diversity of thinking than gender per se. However, it's really difficult to assess or measure diversity of thinking. So gender is a good proxy. Do you and how do you speak with your female and male colleagues about DEIB challenges, for example, salary gaps and promotions? I find it very easy to talk about topics like this because all my colleagues, they care about it. And, and I find the best way to approach it is very much evidence-based looking at what data, what's the evidence there, and also be as objective if as possible and open to debate and changing our mind. You mentioned earlier that you really didn't have a barrier as a woman, but there are many public and internal discussion about the barriers that many women face for reaching higher position in the tech industry. So what is your advice on how to best unblock these roadblocks? there may not be many female role models. So hence, people are not quite sure how to get to there. And that is a problem. I think a way to go about it is really thinking, planning about your career. From another angle, what you can say is that there's a lot of good opportunities out there. What other skills are you trying to build? What are the strengths that you want to leverage on? And so if you are leveraging your strength, knowing gosh, I think I'm pretty good at this and let me build some other skills around this and make me the kind of quite unique person to do certain things. Basically create that possibility for you to get to the senior role because you're bringing in that huge value for organizations. As the tech industry finds it hard to especially retain women, there are a lot of reports right now that a lot of leaders are actually leaving. What is your best advice or strategy for how companies can work to build a stronger corporate culture that engages gender diversity and equality? Really looking, examining your values. So in the case like of our value of seeking truth, it's inclusive culture is fundamental for this value. We need to make sure, for example, in any forum where ideas are debated, there is an environment where every single person's opinion around the table feels fully empowered and the best idea wins at the end, no matter where and who it's come from. We'll start from examining your values and see how those values translate to the behavior of people. So then what would you say are the few challenges then of implementing the IB culture in a workplace today? The biggest challenge would be the attention of the organization or rather the attention of the leadership. How do we make sure this is an important part of, of the business? Being quite thoughtful about it and not taking brass decision about diversity and inclusion, I think is important. So being thoughtful about it and then leadership also has to care. How much do you think the tech industry has changed regarding this subject since you joined? The tech industry has been really very good at pushing for it. There's lots of talks about the topic and there's a lot of communities about exchanging best practices. Looking back on your own career, what one thing would you have changed in your working environment to break the bias? People think that I might not be so good for something because I'm a woman, but I don't actually encounter it. In fact, it's usually if I self-doubt myself, then I will project that unconsciously. So I actually need to be developing that confidence. I wish I started earlier in my journey and career. And looking forward, what will you do as a leader to prove the bias for the next generation of women in tech? I would really love to help women to develop skills that could help them to become better and also change their way of thinking about these things. I would like to share that journey with women early in their career. 
there is nothing about us being women that stops us. It's really whether we have the skills or have we gained enough experience to do it. Let us move on to another hot topic in business day, which is workplace life balance and mental health. Angie, you have without a doubt a busy lifestyle. How do you take care of yourself to maintain a good mental health? I think actually um, aspects of it is being kind to yourself because the reason why we end up having a very busy lifestyle is that we really push ourselves. We are driven, we're motivated, we want to achieve so much. And you know what? Our body can take a second place. Actually, our body is very important and our mental health is very important. Have you ever experienced burnout? I haven't very clearly experienced burned out. What I mean recently is like in the past year, I realized I don't feel stress. However, my body would exhibit stressful symptoms. What I've learned is listening to my body is really important, even though I don't necessarily feel stressed. And, and sometimes actually people around you might sense it more accurately than yourself, uh, especially when we'll be like, we're not stressed. Well, okay, we'll keep going, but your body is telling you something different or your friends and family are telling you something different. What is your advice on how companies can create a more mentally healthy workplace in a new now? It has to start from the culture. It has to be a topic that people are comfortable to talk about. The attitude towards a topic is there's no stigmatism towards it. So in our case, for example, if we treat it like mental health is doing exercise, physical exercise, then it is something people can feel more comfortable to talk about. And from very early days, we started having, for example, mental health coach, which people can go and speak to. So I think once you start having kind of culture like that, then develop your support, whether it can be peer support, it could be confidential counseling support, it could be health insurance. So the culture has to be the starting point. What motivates you every day to get out of bed? A sense of purpose and progress to hopefully make the world slightly better. Now, let us wrap up with a few words of wisdom and a piece of advice for our listeners. Angie, what is the best piece of advice you've been given that has helped you during setbacks in your role and career? I always find the questions people ask me are incredibly helpful. For example, when questions like, what's the worst that could happen to me is incredibly helpful because suddenly it's like, it's not the worst case scenario. So, you know, what other questions like, what's the opportunity here? So suddenly I could start seeing the situation from a different angle. Thank you very much for being a guest on the Queen's Earth Tech Podcast, sharing his journey with, without a doubt, inspire change and reshape company culture for the next generation of women, non-binary and transgender elite. Oh, thank you. No, fantastic. Really big congratulations on this work you're doing. Thank you for listening. If you have worked in the tech industry a minimum of three years and would like to share your journey, please nominate yourself or somebody you know to i at jasminemoradi.com. For more podcast episodes and to learn more about the Queens of Tech initiative and to support us, visit queensof.tech.